Hi, everyone. Welcome to this Horasis meeting. Um, I'm really uh, excited to be moderating this panel. Uh, my name is Priha Shrivastav. Um, I am joining you from London. Um, I'm the international executive editor for Insider um, and based here in London. I've been a journalist for um, a, de a decade and a half now, um, I like to think. Um, and uh, it's, been an, it's, it's been exciting, but I've also been associated with Horasis for uh, nearly four or five years now. And I remember my first time was I was on maternity leave and I just had my, my son was about three months old and I'd met Frank at a conference and he mentioned the opportunity to um, uh, moderate a panel. And I thought, this is great. And I remember leaving my three month old with my husband flying all the way to Majorca um, and moderating a panel. And it was such an amazing experience. I really enjoyed meeting people from you know, various parts of the world for Horasis. And here we are um, moderating, um, moderating this panel virtually because this is the new, new reality, the new normal, as we call it. But I'm joined by some very excite, exciting and very esteemed uh, guests today who have a lot to say about what's been going on uh, in the world today. Now, the topic of this panel is leadership in an age of perpetual change. And the last two years, or a little over last two years, we've seen a lot of change in the world, starting from the pandemic. We've sort of lived through that pandemic and we somehow are still living through that pandemic. Um, we've had, uh, you know, sort of right in the middle of a, a war, so to speak, um, that, you know, where we've had to sort of go back to the drawing board and think about what we want to be able to do, how companies are responding to the crisis in Russia and Ukraine. So, um, and then of course, all on top of that, you've got inflation, you've got um, sort of rising costs, you've got a very bleak macroeconomic environment out there with central banks just ready to start rolling back stimulus. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's just very, very different in terms of the situation. What I think will be very interesting to know is, how leaders have responded to these changes, how leaders have stepped up to respond to these changes. And what does it really take to be that leader? Um, and I think going back to when the pandemic started, a number of companies, especially financial services to say, they were the leaders of financial services companies, big banks suddenly uh, had to sort of, they had this challenge in front of them that, right, we all have to go back and work from home. We have a massive customer base that we have to serve as well. How do we make it seamless for everyone? But they all stepped up and they sort of came up with different um, you know, ways in which how to deal with it. Um, so today we are going to go deeper and deeper into that. Um, and I'm very excited to welcome my panelists. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to open the floor, go uh, to our panelists one by one and uh, request them to um, you know, sort of introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you joining us from? Um, what do you do? And then tell us what leadership means to you. And if you're able to share that one anecdote from the from you know from the start of the pandemic, when as I said, things were uh, extremely sort of in flux, how did you react to that? And then from there, we'll take on and make it as interactive as possible. I can see we have uh, guests joining us as well. So if you have questions please do drop those questions in the comment box, uh, message me on the side. We will have time for questions and answers as well. So let me start by uh, going to Dr. Roger King, who joins us from Hong Kong. Um, Dr. Roger King, uh, if you would like to introduce yourself, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and then that one anecdote um, or you know, your views on what a, what a leader is. Um, you're on mute, uh, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, uh, currently based in Hong Kong. Well, I've been in Hong Kong since uh, 1975. Uh, I'm ethnic Chinese, but born in America. And uh, because my parents went over to the United States to primarily to study, then went back to China, and then we went back to the United States again. Okay. So uh, uh, I've been here since uh, 1975, but I started my uh, life uh, initially working in the United States. In fact, my first job uh, was working for a, a company called Bell Telephone Laboratories. I don't know how many people are familiar with that. And actually I was working in the military research lab on computer science and so forth and so on. Uh, these days I joke around with people. I say, you know, being an ethnic Chinese, I don't think I can secure that job anymore. You know, they, they would think I'm a spy <laughs> over there, okay? Uh, having said that, I, I, I think uh, one uh, very, very interesting thing about my family itself, uh, I have an older brother uh, who was, in fact, uh, 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 he stayed behind in China. He became a PLA soldier, uh, you know, 
uh, People Liberation Army, so a soldier itself. And I, after graduating from uh, university, I became a U.S. Naval officer. So in one family, you have uh, PLA and the, <laughs> the other one is a U.S. Naval officer itself. So anyway, uh, I started life off uh, working for Bell Labs, as I remember uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, and I, I was very, very entrepreneurial. So I decided to leave the lab after working for them for nearly five years. And I started my business coming to Hong Kong itself. And of course, initially it was all involved with computers, computer science, computer distribution business and so forth. And I must say the business was, uh, I was very, very fortunate, had the right connection. You know, this part of the world connection, social connection is extremely important. So I started that business and, uh, and I became uh, interested in many, many other businesses. So, you know, I'm, uh, some people call me a serial entrepreneur, okay? And uh, uh, the life of a serial entrepreneur is very, very interesting. There are two happy days in a serial entrepreneur's life. One day is the, the first day you create the business, and the second happy day is when you sell your business itself. So I've sold many, many businesses over the life, uh, and uh, – so in the last uh, 15 years, I've been affiliated with a university, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And uh, actually, I'm a, a professor of finance, but I've been very, very interested in family, family businesses itself. So today, I'm very, very much focused on that. And later on, I'll discuss about the issues. You, you know, you talk about leadership, uh, you, you know, how fast things uh, change. So I'll, I'll share my experiences in terms of family, family businesses, as well as family offices. So I, I leave that and uh, uh, for other people to ask me questions later on as well. Sure. Thank you very much, Dr. King. That's very, very interesting. And we look forward to coming back to you. Um, I would like to go to Mary now. Uh, Mary, if you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about um, yourself and your views on um, leadership. Thank you very much. So my name is Marie Dezanis, and I am the head of asset management for uh, EMEA for Northern Trust. And I have 32 years in the industry, but God, I, I hope I don't look it. I, I get out of bed every day and passionate by what I do. And it's really motivated around um, the talent that surrounds me. And I'm a big believer that the success, the success of an organization is driven by the quality of people that you have around you. So even in early days in the industry, starting in 1989, it was a very different financial services and environment. And I remember thinking early in my career, um, it's not about ego and having the ability to manage people and fire them. It was really about these people are an investment and how do we get the best out of them? So I've always been a student of culture and tried to understand how do you get the best out of people, even when it wasn't in vogue. And for quite some time, it hadn't been. And one of the lessons that I've learned that was very high impact for me, besides things like your style of leadership is very important, and it's got to be authentic to who you are, as well as being transparent, open, and confident. And, and I'm a big believer that you don't have to have all the solutions, because as we've seen, nobody had the rule book for COVID. But as you can manage in a day-to-day -day environment, being very transparent, vulnerable is a new style of leadership that really is needed to drive people into the next level of success. And one of the books that I read a long time ago that really reflected uh, and, and shaped maybe my, my views was um, Ernest Shackleton's story. It was the story of someone who wanted to circumnavigate the Antarctic. And what he did was he brought a crew of 26 people in a ship and they got stuck in ice floes. And what happened was they were able to successfully over two years get every single member of that crew back to safety. But it's a lesson in leadership from the angle of leaders have to be able to step up in times of uncertainty and be able to not only tell them what to do or guide them or counsel them, but really carve out a time to rest, to celebrate, to talk, discuss, and have normalcy in life, even during chaos. And as I think and reflect upon some of the things I've done as a leader, being able to have normalcy in an environment, financial services is always going to have change. So um, we need to get better and better at that.
So I'm thrilled to be here amongst great colleagues who are thinking about how do we affect the world as far as bringing up talent, navigating change, and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Marie. Um, let's go to Augie now. Um, Augie is joining us from Florida, uh, where it's very, very early. So thank you so much for joining us at this time. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. And um, you know, again, um, what are your views on leadership? Thank you, Spriha. Um, so I'll start with a little background. Uh, like, like Roger, I guess I'm, I'm also called a, a serial entrepreneur. Uh, the latest company that I started is a company by the name of FastForward.ai, which is a digital marketing uh, platform uh, that helps bring brands inside social media, very relevant uh, in, in the new world uh, you know, post-COVID. Prior to that, uh, I was the American founder of a company called Vion, which is a mobile operator uh, with uh, over 220 million subscribers. In fact, we have an operation at Werbo, which you guys will be meeting next uh, in Uzbekistan, as well as uh, uh, many other countries. We're actually the seventh largest operator in the world, though uh, it's a name that's not very well known uh, uh, within the U.S., um, but, you know, my, my background has been telecom telecommunications, consumers, and, you know, the, this whole post-COVID world, indeed, as we've all seen and we'll be talking about here today, requires very different skills for today's leaders. Just to put some context, uh, particularly around uh, consumerism, uh, I'll give, me, give you some stats that I'll share that in the first three months of the initial lockdowns that we, uh, we had due to COVID, e-commerce grew at the same rate as the full previous 10 years. So we all knew that e-commerce was going to be a thing. It just was expected to be a much slower integration. And what's even more impactful than that growth was the diversity of what we call digital natives, of people actually being online. And if you look at what really happened, uh, and it was driven by necessity, you know, basically consumers from ages 9 to 90 are actually now online. You know, and that was something that was very, um, you know, very rare that you'd see uh, such a diverse and such a wide uh, uh, consumer base uh, that, that is now expecting things uh, to, to actually happen quite instantly. I, I actually authored a book during, during COVID called The Impatience Economy, uh, How Social Retail Marketing Changes Everything. And, and the whole premise of, of, of a new trend, I guess, uh, and a new reality is that you know, people are not satisfied anymore with uh, buy now. They want get now. That impatience is something that we as leaders and, and companies that are trying to reach the consumer need to change the whole mindset. Uh, and I guess I, I conclude that I actually am quite optimistic of the future, particularly because of where the world stands with digital uh, inclusivity and, and the fact that the post-COVID world or the, the lockdowns instigated a much broader uh, audience that is now online. If you look at the opportunity for people that are sitting in uh, Ukraine, uh, selling and creating games, uh, creating uh, designer baby clothes. They now have a marketplace to 5 billion social media users that they can actually sell their goods. So I, I think the world has become, uh, in a sense, more accessible to, to smaller and, and more diverse uh, locations and people that I think offers great opportunity going forward for leaders to really push and take advantage of what the new environment uh, offers. Thank you, Augie. And we'll come back to you and talk to you a little bit about e-commerce and how that, that sort of uh, environment is shifting so much and how leaders are reacting to it. But just with the buy now, get now thing, I completely understand and I'm totally with you on this. And a small example of that is I have a four and a half year old at home and he wanted this particular toy. And, you know, we kept having this conversation about trying to get this toy for him. He got my phone and he said, uh, can you check it on Amazon? And I did. And I found it and I ordered and the moment I ordered, he went and stood right next to the door because he thought if I've ordered it, it should just I'd be there. And I had to explain to him it doesn't work like that. It's going to take some time for it to come. But that that's exactly you're right. That's exactly where we are right now. We want it to be very quick. We want we're so impatient. Um, and it's very interesting to see how leaders of these companies will be reacting to a change like that. Um, but let's go to Bo. Bo, I know you're joining us from Uzbekistan. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, my name is Bo Anderson. Uh, as I said to the panel, I think the, I'm the only government employee on the panel. So I work for the government of Uzbekistan. I've been here nine months. Uh, I spent 21 years at GM, including the corporate management, being responsible for global purchase and supply chain. If I look at automotive, I would say automotive before Elon Musk was not that interesting. But when you look at COVID and electrification, 
we have had a lot of changes. And I also would like to thank Frank Richter and his team for arranging this conference. But when you look at electrification, everything is changing. The barrier of entry to being an OEM or making cars before used to be engines and gearboxes. Car makers didn't sell engine and gearboxes to each other. Now everyone can buy an electric engine on Amazon or Alibaba and can get in the business. When you look at valuations, we have startup companies that are valued 25 billion and they cannot build one car. So when I look at leadership, I was the president of Yasaki North America, Central America, Africa, and Europe. 140,000 people when COVID started, 29 countries. It was very difficult to stand in front of the people and say, last month we lost 73 million of cash and in, in explain that with the cash loss, with that magnitude, we need to take corrective actions. But I leave it there. Thank you, Bill. We'll come back to you and talk a little bit about automotive. You're right. I mean, suddenly Elon Musk and Tesla have just made um, the entire sector uh, very interesting. But also for us journalists, um, it's a lot of um, it's a lot of worry and tension in the morning. For earlier, it was President Trump, and now it's Elon Musk. We're just sitting and watching his Twitter feed um, and hoping he doesn't tweet at 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, but we've got some very interesting points here, and I want to start uh, by uh, you know sort of talking about family offices um, uh, and family businesses, uh, Dr. King. We, we live in this environment right now where there's also this um, massive push, uh, you know, for, from startups, you know, as the startups are very, very risk taking. Entrepreneurs want to scale very quickly. They're, you know, they want to take companies public. There is also that debate between growth and scale because there's a lot more scaling happening. But what do you see the trend among family businesses? Do you see um, entrepreneurs for family businesses, uh, you know, have you seen them step up to be more risk taking or do you see them a bit more risk averse? And if they are risk averse, then how do they sort of, um, you know, navigate through the challenges of Yeah, uh, it's very, very interesting. You know, people uh, tend to think of family businesses as a small, medium-sized enterprise it's itself. But, you know, some of the largest firms in the world are actually family businesses. And if you look at the, uh, most economies, 60 plus percent of the contribution to G GDP is actually from family, family business itself. OK, what I'd like to probably to discuss uh uh, well, my evening time today, specifically about the leadership and the impact of leadership as a result of not just uh, COVID, but, uh, you know, the, the concept of Industrial Revolution 4.0 and so forth and so on. You, you know, uh, two very, very interesting things. Uh, you, you know, Bo mentioned about, uh, you know, how th things are changing rapidly and so forth. But, you know, if you think about it, two major things today. One is human lifespan is increasing. But human life, you know, human lifespan is increasing, but business lifespan is shortening, shortening, shortening as a result of, of uh, these uh, disruptors itself. OK, and let me just also uh, emphasize, since I, I'm Asian, I'm based in Hong Kong. You, you, you know, the, the usually the founders of family businesses, they're, they're very, very, uh, you know, they're very, very intelligent. They're very, very good, uh, so forth. But they tend to be very, very uh conservative in a way they don't like to change okay and this this has a significant impact on that and and uh, you, you know they don't like to change they want to control everything you know micromanaging everything and so forth and so on and you know and of course they'd like to pass the business on to the next generation and the next generation usually in our part of the world is the firstborn son that takes over the business itself and usually, if you look at the, you know, we study uh, various uh, behaviors of uh, offspring, the uh, firstborn son tend to be, you know, scholastically very, very good. But one of the characteristics of firstborn son is they are risk averse. And if you think about the successful entrepreneurs today, everywhere in the world, they tend not to be the firstborn, actually. OK, so you can think about that. So one of the biggest problem we have now is the younger generation. They really want to do their own thing. They don't want to follow the father or the, the so-called legacy businesses. So the question is that what are we going to do? Is the notion of family business a dead concept itself? OK, 
And so how do you encourage next generation? There's been some studies done uh, in uh, uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. The next generation of the Chinese families that go overseas to study, when they come back, 80% do not join the family business itself. So how, do, how does one carry on the family legacy, the family value, and so forth and so on, when the next generation all want to be their own bosses and do their own thing? This is one of the biggest challenges. And uh, you, you know, I don't think I personally have an answer for that. But, you know, I'd be very, very happy to hear what other people uh, on the panel uh, think about this big challenge. And how do you, you, you know, um, uh, convert someone that's a micromanager to allow future generations to come up with new ideas and so forth and so on. So these are the biggest challenges I see coming up itself. And perhaps we can discuss a little bit more uh, in depth. Uh, so let me just leave it at that at this time and we can go into much more detail. Well, Roger, I'll add as a, as a fellow entrepreneur, I am not the firstborn <laughs> either. <laughs> so you're right. Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah, now we hear you. Okay. And, and, okay. I'm, and so I'm not a firstborn either. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, just taking lead from what Dr. King is saying, that it's it's very interesting that um, you know sometimes when these events happen, you see uh, the the real. Risk By the way, please call me Roger, not Dr. King. Okay, okay. sure. All right, Roger. Um, yes, yeah, so you really see the real risk taking ability or the nature of the person who is leading that, you know, sort of steering that ship. And Mary, I want to ask from you, what 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 sort of trends do you see in financial services? Because you've over the last two years, there's been a lot of change, and there's been constant change, not just in the last two years. But I mean, if you go back to when the financial crisis happened as well, there's like constant change and constant sort of challenges that are being put. Sometimes leaders don't know what to do. Is it in, in situations like that? How do you react to things like that? So it's very interesting because we have an industry that's highly regulated. And the one thing that the regulator wants to make sure is that we don't have market disruption and that we can continually serve our clients no matter what. The reality is, is with most businesses, especially large corporations, if you would have told them in 2019 that you've got to, in the next five years, migrate your entire business to virtual, they probably would have hemmed and hawed and said that's impossible to do, right? And yet we were able to successfully do that and, you know, keep everyone with us. Year one in COVID was an interesting observation is that people were just running on adrenaline. They were working long hours. They were just trying to get things across the line, making sure that they were meeting the KPIs and the deliverables. And then year two, they were, you know, kind of really going on a, a good year in the financial services industry, but it's not a sustainable pace. So we did learn a lot from technology that there can be a marriage of virtual and in person and people did very much miss their in-person colleagues and, and being together but what we did learn is there's a, a different way to engage and a lot more efficient and if i look at industries in general with more digital presence the concept of being able to co-create ideas or be in different locations and when you are together we have to start thinking about our time differently and we also have to start thinking about leadership differently. In financial services, there's usually a lot of very quantitative people who are not as skilled as the in the emotional quotient too. So sitting around the table, you know, it might be difficult for somebody who's never managed remotely before to engage a group of senior people or tell when someone's not doing well or, you know, probe and 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 have real smart EQ. So what we've done is we we focused on educating people on mental health, looking for signs of fatigue and challenge. We spent a lot of time educating them on how to manage remotely and then also gave some very quick but um, intense thought on how we make sure that we have a culture of trust 
and engaged in a lot of separate dialogues on how we can have people around the table in formal and informal virtual and hybrid meetings collectively contributing, which is, is, is very rapid, especially for you know, a corporate environment. Yeah, no, very good point. Thank you for, for that. And I think uh, just sort of leading for that, I would uh, like to go to Augie because we talked about e-commerce a little bit earlier and, you know, we've uh, we've discussed when, you know, you and I were chatting earlier as well. This is one industry that in many ways was in some way was hit by the by the by the pandemic, but then also really boomed uh, during the pandemic as well. It's seen a lot of ups and downs in the last two years. And there is still sort of you know uh, data to show that this is the trend is going to continue in terms of the boom. How do you, how do you think that you know leadership has been able to play a part in this? You know, it's, it's a very constantly changing uh, industry. So, what do you think um, you know have been the big challenges, and how can leaders how have leaders actually really been able to step up and say, right, okay, I'm going to take it one day at a time, but ensure that you know uh, the industry you know what 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 was happening is successful really. So, would love to hear from you. So, so I actually have seen a lot of challenges for leadership in, in the whole kind of getting into the e-commerce. It's easy to become digital, right? You just go on Facebook, Google, put on an ad, and you think that's digital. But that's not anything close to being really digital and really being a social marketer. And the mindset is a, is a big thing to change because you have the legacy of, of what marketing is supposed to be. You're trying to get the customer to come to you. Well, you know, social and e-commerce is different. It's about you going to the customer. You, you don't have the customer come to you anymore. So you need to change not only your mindset, you're going to change your organization because especially large, fast-moving good uh, companies, they're, they're used to uh, having a very strong, you know, structured marketing program. And again, they think they're digital because they're, they're advertising on, on Facebook and Google, but that's not enough to be digital. At the end of the day, consumers want a relationship. And consumers believe and trust in a brand. So I, I don't think e-commerce is a solution for everything in the future. But for, for large companies, you know, I look at, you know, everyone says, oh, e-commerce now is taking over. Brick and mortar is dead. You look at LVMH. They had a record year in their entire history of the company last year. And they're all brick and mortar. Now, of course, they're also transitioning into the whole e-commerce thing, but it's about mindset. It's about changing the way that leaders change their, their marketing organizations, which is never easy when you have a huge marketing organization to say we're going to do it differently. It's a very bold step and it's a scary step to take. Uh, but, okay, sorry, can I can I just interrupt you quickly on that? Do you think that it would be a different for luxury retail as opposed to sort of consumer retail, like general consumer retail, like LVMH, Burberry, the likes of that? Do you think that brick and mortar would still continue to be very successful on those fronts because people would want to go into the store and feel a 1500 pound or a 2000 pound handbag before they buy it as opposed to buying it online. Yeah, I don't see e-commerce completely replacing and supplanting. I, I think it has to support. And again, the successful brands, and again, even LVMH, they're, okay, yes, they had a record year, but they also have done a very good job in translating that brand inside social media, inside digital media. So the successful companies are going to learn how to really coexist and be the most convenient medium that the customer wants. Some customers will always want brick and mortar. Some customers never want to walk in to a store. And as a brand, you need to be available wherever they are and change that mindset that you go to the consumer. Don't try to get the consumer to come to you anymore. It's a different way of, of marketing. And just sort of before we go to Bo, another quick thing that I wanted to sort of ch chat with you about was how about like reaching out to a very different audience now, the, the Gen Z, for instance, they don't, they, they connect and they engage with brands in a very, very different fashion, not the same way as, you know, it was done earlier. So how are, how are companies or, you know, completely you know, brand leaders responding to something like that? You know, I, I, I met somebody yesterday who said he gets all his news from TikTok. And I, that just goes beyond me. I, I don't understand because I read, I still go to, to read my news, but he reads everything. He gets all his information from TikTok, everything about various brands, everything about what's, what's been happening. And he is as aware as I am. So um, how do, how do, you know, what's the challenge there in terms of connecting with that audience? Yeah. So I got, I don't mean to be a, I'm not promoting as a commercial, but that's exactly what fast forward.ai does. It, it's about using intelligence and, and AI to really, dissect your audience and be able to understand on a person by person basis, not by name, but by characteristic, as you said, a generation or a profile of what's of interest to them. And it's not that difficult in today's day and age with technology that's available pretty much off the shelf uh, as a service that you can really understand a consumer specifically on what they're doing, when they're doing it, where they're doing it. And then you're able to tailor 
what's interesting to them and you create a channel just for them. So the days that you have just one marketing channel, you have only TV or you have only print or you have only uh, uh, billboards are gone. You could have thousands of channels dedicated for a, a person, for a campaign, for a generation, uh, for a, a interest segment. It's not that difficult to maintain that anymore. And then when I talk about needing to change the status quo marketing and that the leader needs to drive that change, because if you've been in the marketing environment your whole life and you've done it a certain way and you have relationships that are very strong, uh, trying to break that is very difficult from the bottom up. And, and it has to be driven from the top down that we must change and really address the needs of people as they live, as they are today. And the technology exists that you can get down to a very granular uh, micro segment. Right. Great. Thank you. And Bo, um, would love to bring you in here because I think your perspective um, is very unique in all of this. You work with the government, as you mentioned, and um, you know, you're also um, heading an automotive uh, company. How, how have you seen, um, you know, what sort of challenges you've seen? Because sometimes managing leadership along with sort of responding to governance is a big challenge in itself. And the last two years, not the the governments or leaders, nobody knew what was going on. Nobody knew how to, you know, navigate our way through this situation. So, um, you know, where, how, how, how did you respond to it and what would be sort of the biggest challenge that you faced? I mean, first I I made more mistakes in in the last two and a half years than I did in the 64 years before. Uh, I've been trying and I still try to focus on four things. Try to ask the right questions. I have had a lot of skip level meetings. So when I was head of Yasaki as a large global automotive supplier, I skipped one, two, three levels and talked to people. And for sure, they were seeing if I would do something with what they told me. And I said, if I don't do anything, they will never tell me again. So for all of us, we can never lose the touch with the people doing the work. The second one, you need to make decisions. Some decisions are very painful, but someone needs to make them. And, and third, you need to clarify what is the purpose of organization and what are the metrics of success. Last is extremely important that you are self-confident. I have always said as a leader, you need to believe that there is a good life coming and you need to give people hope. Sometimes when we had COVID, and I can tell you in in December 2019, we had a problem with our Chinese suppliers. We didn't know because it was because of COVID, but we had delivery problems. The 19th of February, I was flying back from Tokyo to Detroit, and no one told us that we had an airplane crew that potentially was impacted by COVID. But... Later on, we figured it out, right? Officially, COVID started March 11. So my point is, ask questions, reach out. You need to make decisions. You need to reinforce what is important. And you need to give confidence. I'm from Sweden. Some of you know about Sweden as a very small country. I'm an average guy because Sweden, we only export average people. The good one we keep in the country. So the average is me and Slatan Ibramovic. Thank you. That's very, very interesting. And those four points are, I'm going to, I'm going, definitely going to make a note of that and have a, uh, you know, post it on my desk for sure. Um, but making tough decisions. Yes, you're right. It, it is, it is very important for leaders to make those tough decisions um, and also sort of, you know, be confident about the decisions they're making. So at the end of the day, we expect leaders to be visionaries. We expect them to have that vision and really take, you know, steer the ship as they say, or say, you know, sail, sail smoothly. But going back to what we talked about earlier, about how sometimes leaders don't know it, sometimes don't know what to do. Sometimes you are sort of dropped in a situation where you start to think, I have absolutely no idea what to do next. Um, but you can't really say that to your team, can you? Can You can't stand in a town hall and say, I have no idea what to do. Can you do that? Would you? How would you navigate a situation where You've just been dropped into chaos and you have absolutely no idea how to deal with it. And I would love to hear from you all, but also audience, if you have questions, please do send it over. We can look at it after that. So who wants to go first? Maria, go for it. Yeah, I I think actually, if you don't have the answer and you represent that you do, that blows your credibility. 
And I do appreciate that people are drawn to a certain style of leadership that is certain, meaning we will never be going into the office or we are all going back into the office. There are times when you can't make the call. And we have to, in my opinion, as leaders, be authentic and, and be vulnerable and say, there are things that we did not know were going to happen, or we haven't figured this out, but we will figure this out together because we have very smart people actively thinking about the solution and we'll be accountable for it and we'll make the best decisions with the best available information. And that is truly what I think is a hallmark of somebody who can utilize smart, agile talent and also can be authentic. And the second you start uh, representing that you have answers where you don't, I think that compromises credibility. That's a really good point. Anyone else um, would want to jump in? Yeah, please, Roger. Well, let, let me bring in the uh, Asian aspect a little bit, okay? Uh, uh, you, you know, uh, Asians, uh, the concept of face is very, very important, okay? And if you're a leader and, and uh, uh, you, you know, you... you are being viewed as being not doing the right thing, you lose face, okay? This is very, very important itself. So how do you get around that problem? You know, the other thing is I mentioned that people getting older, I mean, continue to work. And I, I think one of the things is instead of, uh, you know, I, I think that some of the older so-called generation, they should retire sooner and let the next generation come in. OK, and, 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 you know, recognize that you may not have the ability to to do certain things and may not have the willingness or the face. You want to say face. Well, why not pass it on to the next generation or uh, our professional managers and so forth and so on, but have the ability to identify where the talents are and and uh, step down and maybe uh, you don't have to lose face that way. Yeah, and maybe let me right. just add, perhaps, uh, you know, the life of an entrepreneur is uh, not having all the answers a lot of the times. I won't say most of the times, but a lot of the times. But but Bo makes a very good point. You know, self-confidence is not having all the answers. Self-confidence is that you're there to lead and figure it out and, and to give give people the opportunity to give you the ideas. And and, and, and as Bo said, I, I'm with him. You need to be down. The people who have to do the work are the ones that actually always have the answers. And you just need to kind of help bring that up, give them the resources they need, the confidence they need. Uh, and, and you get a lot of, um, a, a lot of strength actually in saying, I don't have the answer, but together we'll figure this out. Uh, they want you to lead. Yes. But, uh, and it's not a cop out when you're looking down into your organization to get help. Uh, and in fact, that gets respected. And if that's what builds strong teams. Yeah. Bo, did you want to comment on that? No, but I would like to put another aspect that I'm a slow learner. So at Yasaki, we were in 29 countries. We very quickly found that we needed to protect the health of our workers. And the best way we did that, we connected with the mayors, with the governors, with the health ministers and say, we want to be the benchmark. Help us to become the benchmark. So we didn't know what it would take to be the benchmark, but we said, we want to be the benchmark. Help us to get there. And I was surprised how much help we got from mayors, governors, police chiefs, fire brigade chiefs. And that's something that I had not understood before. And I'm not afraid to say that, but I practice it every day here in my new country in Uzbekistan. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Some very interesting points there. I know we are, we've got only five minutes left. So, and I've got you know, some very interesting people in the room now. So I want to sort of ask you all, I know we've sort of come out of the pandemic, maybe not completely, a little bit for sure, but we are heading into more uncertainty economically, right? We, we, we see, we are hear talks of hiring freezes and layoffs and um, inflation, uh, you know, co cost of living rising and things like that. Again, companies are going to, again, sort of go into that mode where they'll think about how can we cut our costs across the board? In situation like this, um, 
one, how have you all responded to something like this? Um, and second, do you think, uh, in, from your point of view, what do you think the next year is going to look like um, you know, in the world? So if I was to give you a crystal ball, and I love this question, but if I was to give you a crystal ball and ask you, what do you think the next year would look like? What, what would you say? So um, two things. One, how are you planning to respond to the economic uncertainty around you? And second, if I was to give you a crystal ball, what do you think the next year would look like? So let's start with Bo this time because you know we, we start with Roger all the time. So let's go with Bo and Roger in the end. First, I can say I cannot predict the future, but, but I know that having the best capable teams and have a lot of speed helps a lot, right? So, as I said, automotive business is still $10 trillion in revenue, $10 trillion in revenue. But before Elon Musk and Tesla, it wasn't that sexy. Uh, now it has become very sexy. And when you look at Rivian and all the startups that are worth a lot of money, but can I predict the future? No. I think for leaders, communication is extremely important. And I struggle with LinkedIn, with Twitter, with Instagram, and with Telegram. It is very popular in this part of the world. But I think on communication, be early, come out early with your people, be very clear, and be very honest. Even if it's difficult things, be very honest. Thank you, Bo. Um, let's go to Augie. So I, I have an optimistic um, future uh, view for a lot of developing countries, to be honest, because I think they now have an opportunity that they did not have before. If you're in a more developed country, I think it's going to be a little bit more challenging times just because, frankly, um, you know, there's been a very good life for a very long time. And uh, any kind of adjustment, which is definitely there will be adjustments coming, will be a little bit more difficult. But uh, the, the social world has really uh, given an opportunity and opened up markets like never before for people in countries like Uzbekistan, Ukraine, Pakistan, Bangladesh. They now have a global market that they can access. So from that perspective, I think it's really very good news. Uh, you know, social media is always a, uh, a two edged sword in terms of what it uh, does. You know, it's a bit terrifying to hear someone's getting all their news from TikTok, but that is that is the reality of today. We need to face it and we need to be prepared, prepared for that as leaders and understand that uh, it, it's a new it's a new world going forward and we need to be prepared for that. And, and the way that we did things before, you know, it, we, we just need to be learning and adapting and changing and, and driving and motivating change. And youth is everything. You know, getting the youth involved early uh, as as partners and as leaders uh, is is I think the formula for success. So I'm you know for for sure macroeconomically very tough uh, year ahead. But I think on a micro level there'll be a lot of people who will have great opportunities that didn't have opportunities before. That's what I like to hear. Um, let's go to Mary. So I hear a lot of generational themes and, and, and marketing themes and opportunity. Yes, we think inflation will continue. Yes, we think that there will be changes, but our industry is about change, right? There's so many exciting things on how we leverage digital in the future and the like. Um, what's interesting, though, is the generational aspect of not only the largest wealth transfer that's going to take place by 2035, but also the concept of you were at the first time ever that you no longer have to be at the age of majority to be a billionaire. I mean, you mentioned, Augie mentioned TikTok. The person who made the most on TikTok made $17 million last year, and the person behind them made 10. So when we think about how the shifts in generation are going to change and how we can capitalize differently on engaging those generations, we're no longer thinking about our, our uh, partners and employees, about how they're doing um, with just business preferences. This is about segmenting them differently, almost like clients. And I'm encouraged with what we can do with talent in the future. Great. Thank you. Um, and finally, to Roger. Well, you, you know, I, I'm, I too am very, very optimistic because people uh, around me are all learners. They're willing to learn. And I think education is one of the key factors. You, you know, if you stop learning, things are going to stop. In today's world, you just have to, you know, every day you can learn something new. I, I started uh, recently uh, do my so-called morning walks. And in the morning, when you walk, you bring your uh, smartphone with you and you start listening to various uh, subjects on YouTube and so forth. The opportunity to learn is fantastic. 
And we just have to continue to learn and willing to learn. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, you people can't even guess my age. So, yeah, yeah, you know, so, but the thing is that, uh, you, you know, I never stopped learning. And I think this is the key. And I see certain developed countries, you know, the certain segment of, of the uh, business. Uh, uh, <laughs> excuse me, someone's trying to catch that. <laughs> Uh, the the uh, you know the the uh, developed uh, countries, especially in the United States, you, you know you have a lot of people, so called they graduate from high school and they can't even read, okay? And this is really really bad. So for this world to move forward, we really have to put emphasis on education, education, and the willingness to learn. That's the key. Great. Thank you very much. That was a really optimistic panel. And I, I really enjoyed moderating this. Thank you again for your time um, and wishing you all the very best um, for, the, for the rest of the year and what, for what's to come. But yeah, on that optimistic note, I wanted to thank all of you and also thank our audience for listening in and you know for sending me messages on the side as well. It's been great to uh, sort of hear all your comments. Um, so thank you again. And thanks to Frank. Thank you all. See you all. Bye. Bye-bye.